Hi everyone, um, my name is Julia Maeta. We are so pleased that you all could join us for the first lecture of volume two of our No Neuropsychology Didactic Series. Um, if I could get a next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this, this 12 week didactic series, volume two, will bring you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. Next slide. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free, high quality didactic opportunities. Next slide. We would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support for volume one and volume two of our series. Next slide. Um, here are the disclaimers for the series. So this training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own. Next slide. Um, just in instructions, if you're having trouble with audio and um, please use the Q&A chat to raise questions for the moderator. Um, the recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website later this week. Next slide. Wonderful. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dorothy Schumacher for today's lecture on neuroimaging and cognitive features of Catacil, a hereditary disease leading to the early onset of vascular cognitive impairment. Dr. Schumacher is a postdoctoral fellow in the Multicultural Alzheimer's Prevention Program at Massachusetts General Hospital. She completed her PhD in clinical psychology and neuropsychology at McGill University in Canada. Her research interests lie in the investigation of innovative biomarkers to identify aging individuals at risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. She also aims to improve our understanding of relationships between cerebrovascular diseases and various neuropathological processes. At MGH, she studies individuals with Catacil, a genetic condition leading to, the early, leading to early cerebrovascular changes and progressive cognitive impairments. This population allows the characterization of the consequences of cerebrovascular changes in the absence of confounding fac factors typically associated with aging. So without further ado, I know we're all really excited for this talk. I will turn it over to Dr. Schumacher. Hello everyone. First, uh, thank you for attending this online lectures and also for the opportunity to present during this series. Uh, so I'm gonna start my presentation as it was mentioned on the neuroimaging and cognitive features of Ketacil, which is a disease that I'll have the chance to present to you in more details. So Ketacil stands for cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarct and leukoencephalopathy. Uh, it's a pretty hefty name, so for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna use Ketacil, the acronym, but I just wanted to give you a good overview of the actual name. So for those of you who are not familiar with this disease, Ketacil is the hereditary form of cerebral small vessel disease, which is an umbrella term to refer to different condition affecting the small size vasculatures of the brain, such as the veins, the capillaries, and the venules. And the chief clinical consequence of Ketacil is the early and recurrent onset of ischemic strokes. That eventually leads to the early onset of vascular cognitive impairment and dementia. The genetic basis of Ketacil has been well established, and this disease has been linked to mutation in a gene called the NOTCH3 gene, which is located on chromosome 19 and has been found to be involved in the survival and function of vascular smooth muscle cells. Those are cells that surround the, the veins and uh, small vessel disease of the brain and are very important to their function. So Ketacil is a relatively uh, recently described disease. It has been described after an investigation of a family that presented multiple members showing lacunar infarcts with extensive white matter disease without having any risk factors for this type of presentation. And that led to the initial description of the phenotype in 1993. It's three years later that the disease was mapped to a mutation on the NOTCH3 genes in 1996. Ketacil is a rare disease, and uh, estimate from large-scale European studies suggest a prevalence ranging, ranging from 4 to 15 cases per 100,000. Uh, this likely is an underestimate of the actual prevalence of Ketacil because it's still a relatively misdiagnosed and under-recognized condition. 
Also, unfortunately, we don't have current estimate for its prevalence in North America. So it's hard to estimate the prevalence here. And despite being a rare disease, Catacil is recognized as the most common form, uh, monogenic form of strokes and vascular cognitive impairment. In terms of uh, the pathophysiology of Catacil, uh, the characteristic finding consists in the presence of vascular abnormality in the small to middle-sized arterioles that is consistent with the presence of cerebral small vessel disease. So this picture is to the left, uh, represent a classical vessel of the brain and can be divided in three components. So the most inner component is the endothelium, composed of endothelial cells and tight junction between them. The middle section is form of smooth, uh, smooth vessels, uh, smooth muscle cells, sorry. And the most external layer is a uh, elastic external elastic membranes that is form of collagen. And in Catacil, what they have found is that smooth muscle cells are, uh, are disrupted by the position of granular osmiophilic material or GOM. And this leads to an increased thickening of the vessel wall that can be shown in uh, these histological slices. So it is believed that the GOM deposition results in both uh, reduced blood flow and a reduced ability of the blood vessels to, re to uh, regulate blood flow within the brain, leading eventually to uh, cerebrovascular disease. The clinical presentation of Catacil is pretty varied among patients with a variation that's found even within members of the same family. But the main clinical features are the presence of subcortical ischemic events, which are associated with the lack of blood or oxygen supply in a certain part of the brain. And uh, these can include either ischemic strokes or transient ischemic attacks, which are temporary symptoms, such as a loss of consciousness. And most patients will have two to five uh, of these subcortical ischemic events over years. Another important or central feature of Catacil is the presence of cognitive impairment in, in dementia that is vascularly uh, related. And the cognitive impairment in Catacil is progressive and is known to worsen with stroke. Dementia is found in as much as 90% of patients with Catacil uh, before death. And the earliest cognitive symptom in most cases is impairment in executive function. It's been shown that most patient age over 35 years show some degrees of impairment in, ex in executive function. Migraine with aura is another clinical manifestation that's pretty common in Catacil. Uh, aura symptoms are, um, sorry, symptoms that precede the migraine episode. And most of the time, these aura are of, of visual nature. So either flashes in the, the retina or uh, blurry lines. So there's different type of aura. It can also be a sensory or motor disruptions. And catacel patients have been found to have these migrants with aura uh, at a prevalence of 20 to 40% of these patients. And that's a prevalence that's five times greater than what is found in the general population. Another common uh, features of catacil is the presence of mood disturbance that can be present in 20% of patients. And the mood disruption usually take the form of a major oppressive, uh, depressive episode. Other mood disturbance have been reported in, in this patient populations, including uh, bipolar disorder, uh, also hallucination. And another common feature is that is linked to mood disturbance, but distinct from depression is apathy, characterized by the absence of uh, motivation. And apathy has been found to be present as, as much as 40% of patients with catacil. Finally, catacil can present other diverse neurological symptoms, including uh, seizures, intracerebral hemorrhage, which are uh, bleeding in the brain. There's also some report of gait impairment and Parkinsonism. Uh, although a lot of variance is observed in disease manifestation and clinical progression in Catacil, the classic phenotype is as such. 
So migraine with aura, when they're present, they're usually the earliest clinical signs of catacil. White matter hyper intensity on MRI is known to be the earliest radiological markers of the disease and uh, is present in the very vast majority, if not all, of patients with catacil age above 30 years. Strokes usually occur in the fourth to fifth, uh, fourth to fifth decades. Cognitive impairments follow strokes and uh, usually start with impairment in executive function and progress to dementia with years. And finally, mood disturbances, apathy, and motor disability are observed at a later stage of the disease. Typically, these patients will die in the seven to eight decades of life. So in a clinical uh, setting, a diagnosis of Kerasol can be suspected in patients that show with the early onset of stroke or transient ischemic attack, especially in the absence of risk factors or known cause for such event. In patient presenting recurrent stroke or transient ischemic attack, or presenting radiological evidence of small, dis small vessel disease at an early age and in the absence of other cause. And family, family history is uh, important in these cases because Cadacil is an autosomal dominant disorder. So any family history that suggests a, an autosomal dominant transmission pattern or that comes with a family history of early stroke and dementia could be indicative of a Cadacil diagnosis. The diagnosis of Cadacil is confirmed via genetics uh, testing, which is the gold standard, but uh, skin biopsy can also be uh, performed to confirm Cadacil when accompanied with the presence of granular osmiophilic material. Sorry. So Cadacil is a relatively pure model of cerebral small vessel disease and a vascular cognitive impairment because it, uh, it has an early onset and it comes in the absence of other confounding factors that we usually found in uh, older cohorts, such as comorbid neurodegenerative disorder or uh, important cerebral vascular risk factors. So there's many advantages of studying this uh, disease in the context of research on cerebral small vessel disease and vascular cognitive impairment. I did include uh, characterizing the clinical cognitive and neuroimaging presentation specific to the presence of cerebral small vessel disease and BCI, validate specific biomarkers, characterizing the disease trajectory in a specific way, understanding mechanism linking cerebrovascular change to changes in, con in cognition that is not confounded by any age-related factors, and it also allowed to characterize risk are protective factors for worse outcome, including factors associated to genetics and lifestyle. In our lab laboratory, we have been studying uh, asymptomatic individual with Kerasil. In this context, asymptomatic means that these uh, subjects were stroke-free and were not demented. And uh, we did that as a way to characterize changes in cognition in the early stage of cerebral small vessel disease, characterized changes in structural, microstructural, and functional neuroimaging markers, and characterized association between these neuroimaging markers and cognition. To do so, uh, we have been very fortunate of being able to study a cohort of subject with Cadacil from the region of Antioquia in Colombia, which is depicted in red here in the map. And Antioquia uh, has been considered a genetic isolate in the sense that after a big immigration period, the population of Antioquia really grew internally. Therefore, there was a big spread in any form of autosomal dominant mutation across generations. So in collaboration with the research team of, uh, of Dr. Lapera at the University of Antioquia, we had access to one of the largest registry of individual with Kerasil. And although this uh, registry includes a lot of various natural mutation leading to Kerasil, they showed a high or a typically high prevalence of the R1031C mutation. Using this registry, we were able to 
uh, to select individuals that were at asymptomatic stage of Keratosil as well as their family members to participate to an MRI study that included a three Tesla MRI, a neuropsychological evaluation, and all of this was done in a double blind fashion. So neither uh, the participant nor the experimenters were aware of their mutation status at the time of the testing. So in terms of uh, neuropsychological evaluation, we uh, looked at four main cognitive domains, including executive function, memory, processing speed, and language or semantics. And we used a standard neuropsychological tests that were validated in Spanish. And these tests are described here. We also were interested in using the INECO frontal screening test which is a brief screening questionnaire to assess executive function uh, pretty rapidly. So it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to administer. And because executive function can be pretty challenging to assess because of the multifactorial nature of this domain, we figured that this uh, screening tools could be a useful test to detect executive dysfunction in the context of cerebral small vessel disease. So this frontal screening has been developed in Argentina, and it includes uh, eight subtests that measures three larger domain of executive function, including uh, response inhibition and set shifting, abstraction, and working memory. And uh, in the end, we obtain a score out of 30, reflecting the global executive state. Using the structural MRI sequence that we acquired, we characterized uh, basic or standard structural markers for cerebral small vessel disease, including the volume of white matter iron intensity. So white matter iron intensity can be uh, easily seen on flare images as area of bright signal or hyper intense signal. And we use a semi-automated algorithm to automatically uh, automatically segment these hyperintense region and obtain a volume count. We also counted the microbleeds across the full brain. So microbleeds can be detected on susceptibility weighted images and are seen as small round uh, areas of dark signal or hypointense signal and are believed to reflect uh, the presence of small chronic bleeding in the brain. And these were uh, visually identified on susceptibility weighted image and counted across the brain. We also looked at uh, lacunes, which are found also on flare images as valid areas of signal IPO intensity that is similar to the CSF and usually surrounded by a rim of white matter IPO intensity. And these are usually found in white matter IPO intensity. And we counted these across the full brain. Finally, we uh, looked at the severity of perivascular space enlargement. So perivascular space enlargements uh, or perivascular space are CSF filled space that surround the vessels and contributes to clearance. And the enlargement of perivascular spaces have been uh, described in many pathological condition and are believed to reflect issues with either inflammation or clearance. So we specifically in our cohort looked at perivascular space enlargement in the basal ganglia because Keratosil is mostly a subcortical uh, disease. And for this, we can use a rating scale that have been described and uh, entails counting the enlarged space within an hemisphere. To quantify microstructural integrity of the white matter, we relied on diffusion MRI and we use a pretty recently described technique, which is called the peak width of skeletonized mean diffusivity, or PSMD. And PSMD is a fully automated marker that's based on tensor imaging and uh, can be achieved pretty quickly and automatically uh, using three main steps. So the first step is pre-processing that allows deriving the FA and MD maps. The skeletonization of white matter tracks and finally, the analysis of the histogram or distribution of MD value within these white matter tracks. So in brief, PSMD represents an index of the dispersion of MD uh, mean diffusivity values within these, this white matter skeleton. 
We also estimated functional integrity of the brain relying on resting state fMRI analysis and our uh, fMRI and acquisition when this was analyzed with the CON toolbox, which is a pretty complete uh, toolbox that allows to pre-process the image using basic uh, pre-processing steps, but it also includes a um, more advanced statistical approach to allow reducing noise in the data. We were interested into looking into the integrity of large-scale resting state network uh, that consists in two networks of previously described brain regions that are widespread across the brain and have been shown to have a consistent pattern of co-activation uh, during a state of rest across studies. These various networks are believed to underlie cognitive processes and some of the common Networks include the default network, uh, the dorsal attention network, the executive networks, but there's also more elementary networks such as the sensory motor system, visual and auditory system. So now to go over our results. So this is just a brief table describing the demographic features of our sample, which included in the end 23 non-carriers or control subject, as well as 22 uh, asymptomatic Ketasil subject. So the Ketasil group was on average younger than the non-carrier group, but there was no difference in terms of education level, uh, gender representation, nor in terms of depressive or anxiety symptoms. The Ketasil group performed lower on the MMSC than the control group after controlling for age. When looking at more detailed uh, neuropsychological performance, confirming pre previous results, we found that there was a significant reduction in executive functioning for the Ketasil group as opposed to uh, the non-carriers after controlling for age and education level. There was no other significant difference across other domains evaluated. Uh, when looking at performance on the uh, inical frontal screening, so the brief screening measure to assess executive function, we found that there was a significant group difference across all subdomains of the test, as well as in the total score. We also show in our sample that the, the performance on the IFS was significantly and pretty strongly related to uh, performance on the executive function composite. Uh, assess with standard neuropsychological tasks. And this kind of corroborate, corroborate, corroborated, sorry, the validity of this task in capturing uh, executive dysfunction. In terms of the analysis of structural MR markers of cerebral small vessel disease in Kerasil, we uh, showed significant difference in terms of the white matter acre intensity volume after it was normalized on brain volume. There was also a higher number of cerebral microbleeds in this asymptomatic ketacyl cohort relative to, uh, to the non-carrier group. In terms of the lacunes, uh, there was no lacunes in non-carriers, and lacunes were only found in two asymptomatic uh, ketacyl subjects, suggesting that it's not one of the earliest and most, most common manifestation of the disease. However, there was uh, nonetheless a significant group difference. Finally, we also highlighted a significant and strong difference in terms of the severity of perivascular space enlargement in the basal ganglia region. So researchers from the large-scale uh, longitudinal Rotterdam study have proposed a score to incorporate all of these structural measures of cerebral small vessel disease into a single matrix. So this score is computed as such. So the presence of moderate to severe white matter eye intensity is given a point. The presence of one or more microbleed is given another point. The presence of one or more lacune is given a point. And finally, the presence of moderate to severe enlargement of perivascular space in the basal ganglia is awarded another point. So in the end, you you get a score, an ordinal score from one to four representing the overall burden of these MRI markers. And what we found in our Ketasil cohort is that this score was significantly increased in Ketasil as opposed to non-carriers. 
we also found a significant association with an increase in the CSVB sum score and a reduced performance on executive function assessed with the inequal frontal screen. So this last section was presenting various and common structural MR markers for cerebral small vessel disease. However, a previous study that have aimed to validate these markers as a biomarker for vascular cognitive impairment and dementia have sometimes found a weak or sometimes incongruent relationship between these structural markers and the presence of cognitive impairment. And then as in, it has been proposed that structural MR marker only allowed to capture the tip of the iceberg that actually represent a cerebral small vessel disease, and that the pathological changes arise many years prior to the appearance of these structural abnormality. It is thus possible that other MRI modalities might allow to capture uh, and be more sensitive to the early cerebrovascular change and their clinical symptoms. And one of the MRI approach, uh, which shows the potential to uncover changes associated with cerebral small vessel disease, is diffusion tensor MRI. So quickly, uh, diffusion tensor MRI is, a, is an MRI technique that is based on the uh, quantification of the motion of water molecules within the brain. And it's based on a principle that is called the anisotropy principle, where uh, water molecules, when they're free of any constraint, they're diffusing in any direction pretty equally. In contrast, in the presence of fibers, uh, white matter molecules should move uh, faster along the fibers than perpendicular to them. So based on this principle, this allows to, to detect or estimate uh, the integrity of white matter fibers. So there's commonly extracted measure from DPI sequence is fractional anisotropy, which is the normalized uh, standard deviation of uh, these diffusivity parameters, and mean diffusivity which is the mean of the diffusivity. And these two measures have been widely associated with various pathophysiological processes, such as uh, edema, gliosis, uh, demyelination of fibers, and inflammation. So here are just uh, images to represent these metrics. So A and B shows just a general P1 images, so a structural scan. C and D shows here the mean diffusivity. E and F shows the FA, and GH shows the color-coded FA, which allows to kind of infer the direction of the tracks. You can have also more fancy-looking uh, analysis, which are called like track geography, which allows a 3D visualization of the fiber track. So as mentioned before, for the purpose of the study, we used the fully automated uh, PSMD uh, metric to quantify the integrity of uh, fiber tracks in our populations. And what we show is that this PSMD values was strongly uh, increased in cadastral subject as opposed to the non care group. And a more strongly increased PSMD values believed to reflect a lower integrity of the microstructural fibers. Because of this significant difference between group, we were wondering whether this uh, this metric could be used as a classificatory or stratifying metric to compare non-characteristic CADA. So, and we did a receiver operating characteristic curve analysis to see uh, the discriminant ability of this metric. And overall, uh, the ability of the PSMD in distinguishing group or the accuracy was 0 0.84, and it was associated with a sensitivity of 0 0.95 and a specificity of 0 0.74. So this is pretty impressive and interesting that a single metric that can be achieved and computed pretty quickly as a pretty strong or satisfactory classification ability. Another interesting thing is that the PSMD value was strongly associated with the normalized volume of white matter hypersensitivity and also associated with 
lower performance and executive function, suggesting that this metric not only is able to distinguish between groups, but also is related to other clinical markers of Kerasil. We also uh, looked at functional MRI as a way to capture underlying burden and neuronal dysfunction associated with cerebral small vessel disease in our cohort. Uh, just briefly, uh, functional imaging relies on capturing a signal that is impacted by the level of oxygen in the blood, called the bold signal. The underlying uh, rationale of this is that when activated, a region, a brain region needs more oxygen. And this is supplied via what we call the hemodynamic response. And the hemodynamic response leads to a change in the ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated blood. And this can be captured by the MRI because of the different properties of these two types of blood. So using functional MRI, one can assess the association between an input and the hemodynamic response across the brain, which is uh, what is often the underlying rationale behind task-based fMRI. So for example, in figure one, this is a response uh, to single auditory words. So you have activation here and the hemodynamic response is flooded. But another type of analysis is to uh, look at association between hemodynamic responses at a state of rest and see the coherence in that response across different regions in the brain. This is depicted in figure, in figure two. And because of the sim simplicity of the acquisition of resting state FFM fMRI, it has attracted a lot of uh, interest in recent years. In this study, we focus on um, one of the most commonly studied resting state network, which is known as the default mode network. And the default mode network include a region of the parietal lobes, the uh, posterior cingulate, the prefrontal cortex, as well as temporal areas. And these regions have been shown to be consistently deactivated during a state of rest. Past studies have shown that activation within the diffomal network has been linked to first very various pathological states and as well as underlying various cognitive process that are self-referential, such as episodic memory. So here you can see the result of our analysis. So this is the average diffomal network in non-carrier subject, as well as the average diffomal network in the catacel group. And what we did, we uh, computed a global connectivity metric based on the average of pairwise correlation between nodes of the network. So this kind of give us an idea of the intrinsic connectivity of the network for each group separately. And when comparing this metric across group, we found an increase in activation within the NIFO network in catacel subject as opposed to non-carriers, and this is after controlling for age. We also found that there was an association with increased diffomal network connectivity and the volume of normalized white matter hyperintensity, as well as an increase in diffomal connectivity and PSMD, which reflects the microstructural integrity. Diffomal network connectivity was also associated with cognitive uh, markers. So we found a marginal association with an increased diffomal network connectivity and reduced executive function. And we found a significant as association with this increase in diffomal network connectivity and persisting speed. So in the previous section, I presented uh, structural, microstructural, and functional MRI markers kind of separately. And in this next section, we were interested in obtaining a more global overview of the combined implication of these markers with regards to clinical presentation in Catacil. So to do so, we first explore relationship between uh, the progression of cognitive impairments or the severity of cognitive impairments and change in uh, quantify MR markers in these asymptomatic Catacil subjects. 
we quantified uh, biomarkers and cognitive abnormality based on the average of the control group and after controlling for age and education. Overall, what this uh, graph is showing us is that starting even prior to the appearance of cognitive abnormalities, there's already changes in uh, PPI metric and structural MRI. However, changes in connectivity seems to arise at a later stage of cognitive impairment. Interestingly, it seems that uh, the diffusion MRI metric seems to gain importance with advancing cognitive abnormalities. We also uh, looked at the combined and independent contribution of these MRI markers using multiple linear regression model. And when combined, these markers accounted for as much as 61% uh, of the variance in cognition, which was pretty Im impressive. Uh, however, it seems that really the PSMB metric, which is based on DPI, seemed to account for the most variance in performance with, by its Im itself, this measure accounted for 40% of the variance. We next computed a similar model, but this time we incorporated interaction terms between modalities. And interestingly, this model showed that the interaction between uh, DPI and fMRI, so PSMD and the full network connectivity, uh, seemed particularly important in accounting for cognitive deficit in Kedasto. So to conclude this talk, um, the aim of this talk was to provide a global overview of neuroimaging and cognitive features of CADASO. And uh, to do so, I presented results uh, from this cohort we have been studying of asymptomatic CADASO subject from Colombia. In this cohort, uh, we characterize MRI markers of cerebral abnormalities, as well as characterize association within these markers and cognitive dysfunction. So from the result that I presented, structural, microstructural, and functional MRI markers of cerebral small vessel disease were all affected in these, uh, these asymptomatic KEDASO subjects. They were also all associated at different degrees with cognitive functioning. However, it seemed that DPI markers, so PSMD in this case, were particularly relevant in understanding cognitive dysfunction associated with cerebral small vessel disease. Our result also supports an interaction between MRI markers in accounting for cognitive dysfunction. As such, it is possible that different MRI techniques provide distinct but complementary information on disease presentation. So the field uh, and interest for KSL has been growing in recent years. However, there's still a lot to be uh, discovered and to, to be done in this patient population. So future studies are needed. And one of the, the main obstacles with keratocell research is the need for larger sample size. So this is a common issue with uh, rare disease. It's difficult to, to coordinate larger sample size. Uh, we also need uh, more study to determine which markers are the most sensitive to the earliest stage of CADASO. To characterize the interplay between these different markers as our result suggests. To track changes in these markers in relation to disease progression for asymptomatic to symptomatic. We also need study to allow detecting which markers are relevant to predict clinical outcomes. So this, this would need studies adopting a longitudinal design and following these individuals over multiple years. So the main clinical outcomes here would be a strokes and dementia. There's also a big need for study to allow us understanding the phenotypic variability of CADASO. So as I mentioned earlier, CADASO is a disease that have a very heterogeneous course with very heterogeneous symptoms. It has been suggested that factors such as uh, genetic mutation site or lifestyle factors, such as cardiovascular risk factors, play a role in this phenotypic variability, but it's still poorly understood. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, the research group I've been working on this project. So 
the laboratory of Dr. Yaquel Quiroz and uh, the fellows and doctoral students that work in the lab. Also, I've been working with jo Joseph Arboleda Velasquez on uh, analysis of blood samples that I've been presented in this talk. Dr. Anand Vishwanathan at the Stroke Research Center. And finally, uh, the group of Dr. Francisco Lapera, which were essential into recruiting and testing these subjects. And above, and all, uh, all the Colombian families that took their time to participate to this research project. Thank you all for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Schumacher. Um, we do have a few questions, so uh, we'll start with some that are related to differential diagnosis. Sure. Um, one person asked, is there any cognitive function or profile that can be used as a differential uh, tool at this point? Right. So it's a bit the same thing here as uh, for age-related neurodegenerative conditions. So there's not one single function that would allow detecting or differentiating a cerebrovascular profile as opposed to another neurodegenerative uh, profile, uh, especially because the site of stroke can uh, impact the cognitive function that it's, are going to be targeted. So it's, it's pretty variable. Of course, at an early stage, uh, in the absence of stroke, executive function seems to be a very consistent uh, markers of cadacil and of early cerebrovascular changes. But with advancing disease, research has shown that most of the cognitive function can be affected and then differential diagnosis becomes very challenging. All right. Um, relatedly, is there a specific imaging modality that is more sensitive or has been shown to be more sensitive at this point in detection of cadacil? I know you reviewed a number of different Right. Um, types of imaging. Right. Um, well, there's still a lot of research being conducted in that domain, but from our earlier uh, results, it seemed that form of DTI metrics, such as the PSMD uh, automated uh, metric, seems to be particularly sensitive to at least the clinical presentation in terms of the cognitive dysfunction in this disease, and even at a very early stage of the, the disease. So we showed that the PSMD values in these subjects showed a classification accuracy of 0.84, a sensitivity of 0.95, and a specificity of 0.74, which is pretty uh, good for the small sample size that we add. So I would say that's a very promising modality that would need to be uh, studied further. Certainly. Um, the next question is related to um, if you don't have a genetic profile uh, on a patient, but you notice some of these historical factors like migraines with aura, TIA, stroke um, at an early age, do you recommend uh, getting patients tested for the genetic mutations? I would say yes, especially if there's a family history that supports some pattern of inheritance. Uh, uh, so yes, definitely. Um, so a lot of our viewers are from uh, North America, and we had a couple of questions about if you know of any prevalence estimates for Catacil in North American or US-based samples. Right, uh, so unfortunately, no, the research of Catacil has been lacking in the US. So I think now it's starting to, to grow in terms of interest, but we still have no organized cohort. So most of the Catacil research is from Europe, actually with big groups in Italy, uh, and in France, um, so no, no estimates so far. All right, um, this may be more related to uh, treatment or resources for Catacil patients. Are there any um, research studies or programs or support groups or anything of that nature for Catacil either in the US or in other countries that might be able to be accessed remotely? All right, so there's, a a couple of patient organizations in the U.S., so one of them that I've been working with, and they are really great, is the Cure Catacil organization. And they have a website with uh, patient resources. They also have a registry where patients and their family can enroll uh, without necessarily disclosing personal information or all. Uh, so I would recommend uh, looking into their, their information and websites. 
Okay, perfect. Um, and we can go ahead and link that on the website as well when we upload the recording. Okay, I'll be happy to send that. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, so similarly uh, related to resources and treatment, um, if someone is diagnosed with Catacil and has mild cognitive impairment, are there any um, medications or treatments that can be recommended that may delay progression, um, perhaps Aricept or Namenda, or are there contraindications for those medications in Catacil? Right. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not well versed with the current medical approach for Catacil, so I, I wouldn't want to say anything. Uh, but I know there have been some clinical trials trying to look at cholinergic treatment. I'm not sure. I, from what I remember, I, I don't think they were they were very successful. So there's no current uh, very recommended treatment approach for this disease or to treat cognitive impairment, but I'm, I'm not an expert in that domain. I'm sorry. No, that's, that's definitely okay. Um, the next question is related to any maybe modifiable behavioral risk factors mm -hmm. um, for Catacil. So physical activity, smoking, diabetes control. Um, are those similar for Catacil? Yes, and uh, studies have shown that uh, cardiovascular risk factors are linked to worse outcomes uh, in terms of disease severity. So smoking has definitely been shown to be, uh, to be avoided in these patients, uh, such as hypertension management seems to be very important. Uh, so yeah, it seems to play a factor. Okay. Um... Where this one is related to um, your research uh, results. So this person uh, asked, were there differences between the control and patient groups in terms of those vascular risk factors? No, so, and this has been shown in other studies. So at least when they're young, these subjects do not present with uh, abnormal levels of cardiovascular risk factors. And we, we did compare these groups across those standard cardiovascular risk factors, including smoking, diabetes, uh, hypertension, arterial fibrillation, and we haven't found any uh, difference in terms of representation of those risks. Okay, um, just a couple of questions left. Do you know of the incidence rate? So this person is asking for older adults. Is there a um, estimate of incidence rate of Catacil in those over the age of 65? Uh, I'm not aware of that, unfortunately. All right. Um, no, that's totally okay. The last question here, I'll go ahead and double check the Q&A box just to make sure we didn't miss any. Um, but the last question here is related to DTI. Um, is there a DTI marker distribution in the progression of cognitive impairment across brain regions? For example, from frontal to posterior or one region to another specific region. So from what I understand, is there a gradient of like in a cerebral amyloid angiopathy? Um, I'm not sure. So the PSMD approach that we use is a global metric and a catacil has been shown to be pretty subcortical in nature. So I would say probably there would be a subcortical cortical gradient in terms of the severity of DTI measure uh, changes. But, but this would be interesting to see if this research has been done. Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, okay, it looks like we got all of the questions. Um, so thank you so much again, Dr. Schumacher, for this presentation. Um, very thorough, very interesting. And so if anybody has further question, please feel free to email me. Uh, I'll be happy to discuss Kedasil more uh, as I find it's a fascinating subject and a subject that deserves more attention in the research community. Definitely. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate everyone tuning in this week for our volume two kickoff. Um, next week, we will have uh, Dr. Chris Howard, Dr. Monica Rivera Mint, and um, Dr. Monroe Cullum for social media and networking, everything you need to know. Um, so, we're looking forward to seeing you all then. Thank you so much again.